on right now in Massachusetts and we heard a video this morning um, that kind of showed his delusion, showed his uh, state his mental state and then we just heard from a doctor a psychiatrist who took the stand um, and it was actually a witness called by the prosecution yeah uh, and Ken both of us were a little bit perplexed uh, yeah. about exactly why the prosecution would want to bring this doctor to the stand yeah we, we weren't quite sure what we were watching for a second we thought actually to be honest we thought for a minute that maybe the the prosecution had rested and we didn't know <laughs> This yeah, was it was a little confusing. Case. But look, it, it makes sense. There, there's a Supreme Court case by the name of Brady v. Maryland that basically stands for the prosecution, if they uncover evidence that uh, is exculpatory, points towards, you know, innocence of the defendant, it has to be disclosed. And I think, you know, they paid for this guy, he did an analysis of him, and the evidence in this case that this guy brought forward, it's a little bit exculpatory. He says he doesn't believe he's criminally culpable, could not appreciate the difference between right and wrong in his state. So basically, uh, even though this was very confusing, the doctor's testimony, uh, you know, he was saying he didn't suffer from a personality disorder. He was a high-functioning person who yeah. suffered from Asperger's, which is a form of autism. Um, but you're saying he had to bring this guy, the prosecution had to bring this guy to the stand, other word, uh, because the defense would basically use it against yes, him. Yes, you have, the Supreme Court has interpreted Brady v. Maryland to, be, to stand for a constitutional right that district's attorney's offices in criminal prosecutions have to turn over exculpatory evidence that their investigation uncovers. This guy's analysis of Mr. Loya is part of the DA, DA's office investigation, and it did his conclusions are exculpatory. They do say that this guy in his mental state due to his mental disease could not appreciate the difference between right and wrong. So if the prosecution had not brought forth this witness, they'd possibly in, be in Brady violation That would be a Brady which violation. Which would be a very serious thing which for the prosecution. Which was very common in this country uh, prior to that case. Prosecutions off, prosecutor's offices would uncover evidence that indicated innocence in cases, but they would still go forward because they would say, look, it's not our job to uh, you know, prove innocence. We're, our job is to prove guilt. And the Supreme Court said, no, it's not your job just to prove guilt. It's your job to further the interests of justice. And if that means disclosing exculpatory evidence, that is on the prosecutor to do so. And we're just told from the courtroom, um, and I believe we're looking at some video in the courtroom, that they're taking a short, I assume, morning break and that we'll hear from more testimony. What's going to be really interesting, Ken, is when we have the defense uh, cross-examining this doctor, which I expect that will happen um, after the break. Yeah, I mean, I what think... What would you do? I mean... What would I the, do? Yes, if... Cross-examining this, this doctor? Yes. I, I'd run up to him and give him a high five, you know, because his testimony was extremely helpful. I don't know that you need to cross-examine him that much. In fact, I, I would be scared uh, of cross-examining him too much and, uh, you know, potentially getting some answers you don't want. And again, we are watching the Loya, Adrian Loya case uh, out of Massachusetts, right near the Cape Cod area. Um, we have been hearing testimony from this morning, a prosecution witness, a doctor, he's a psychiatrist that talks to uh, Adrian's mental state. And Ken, we know how important this is to the case because this is the entire defense. No question in this case who done it. Uh, I mean, the guy, for God's sake, has GoPro video of him yeah. committing the crime. Um, so, so again, this testimony by the doctor, uh, while some might say is a little dry, is crucial. Yeah, this testimony is crucial. It's even more crucial, and I'm sure the defense is going to make a point to note this in their closing argument, that this guy is a prosecution witness. Right. And he's basically backing up the defense's theory of the case, that this guy, Mr. Adrian Loya, suffered from a mental health defect or disease, namely Asperger's, and that because of that, could not appreciate the difference between right and wrong in his actions, and therefore is not criminally culpable. And that was the first thing that came out of this doctor's mouth when he took the stand. Yeah. We were all shocked when we heard that. Uh, Ken and I, sitting here, we said, wait a second, wait a second. We thought that this was the prosecution's doctor that was going to prove that he somehow understood the wrongfulness of what he did. Instead, the doctor said somewhat of the opposite of that, but then also 
uh, talk to the fact that he didn't suffer from a personality he disorder. He wasn't delusional. He wasn't schizophrenic. You know, stuff like that. And I think the prosecution really had to get that out of him. You know, so when they bring on their next expert to totally contradict him, they'll have already laid the groundwork that, listen, Adrian Loya is not delusional. He doesn't suffer from any schizotypal uh, personality disorder. And that, you know, at the end of the day, he was high functioning. You know, this doctor mentioned it several times, high functioning. One could reasonably argue that someone is high functioning, and in order to be high functioning, in fact, you have to be able to discern the simple uh, difference between right and wrong. And what's also interesting is uh, this whole theory that Dr. Martin Kelly, who was the witness that we were hearing from, put forth to the jurors. Um, and like you said, it was the fact that he suffered from, that he was a high functioning person, that suffered uh, with Asperger's. Um, but the question I have for you, Ken, is autism, Asperger's, has it ever been used in a court of law to your knowledge, or is it commonly used in a court of law to prove uh, the legal definition of insanity? In other words, a person not being able to know the difference between right and wrong. My experience, people with autism still know if, if they're doing something wrong. Yeah, I mean, look, maybe there are certain crimes that this defense is more applicable to. Uh, maybe someone forging checks, maybe they didn't really understand the the intricacies of uh, f writing a check out, something right. like that, something more ministerial. But certainly, at a base level, we are expected into society to value human life and to understand that the taking of a human life is wrong. It is a very core principle of society. And this guy, like they said, high functioning. Mm -hmm. They also said no evidence of this disease in his earlier schooling no evidence of this disease from his formal military records with the Coast Guard. You know, this disease has conveniently popped up and been diagnosed in the aftermath of this brutal murder. Um, so how detrimental do you think this witness was to the prosecution's case? I mean, it's hard to say now. It's really going to hinge on uh, number one, it, when the defense cross-examines him, if they're very careful and don't step into any minds, you know, and try mm -hmm. to just let his testimony stand. I would leave it alone. Sometimes the trick to being a good lawyer is knowing when not to speak, as much as saying the right thing. And I think the defense should really just chill out, let this guy's testimony stand, get up there, high five him, thank him for coming in and right. standing. You know. So I guess what, what the prosecution is going to try to do now, f from my understanding, is they're going to bring another doctor to the stand that's going to have a different medical opinion from uh, uh, this doctor yeah. and try to counter that to prove that, in fact, he didn't know the difference between right and wrong. And so what the jurors are basically going to have to do is parse these experts and try to determine who is, who, who's right. Yeah. That's a difficult task, especially when, you know, you don't really have any knowledge or background in this field. Yeah, well, look, I mean, th this guy was certainly very well credentialed. You know, Harvard Medical yeah. School uh, professor, I believe, he said at one point. And, uh, you know, lengthy, decades long of experience in the psychiatric world. You know, and look, they brought him in, he did his analysis, this was the conclusion he reached. He had an ethical obligation to state what his medical conclusion was. The next doctor, look, people can look at the same set of facts and draw radically different conclusions. And it's going to be up to the jury to really make their own conclusion as to which expert they give more weight to and more credibility to. So can earlier in the day when the court first started, we heard a tape that was played uh, excuse me, that was recorded in 2014 uh, as he was setting up this camera that he used to spy on his victims. And it was basically a recording of himself. We could only hear the audio. I believe the jurors could hear, uh, could see the video. And it, uh, the defense wanted it played in its entirety because it really played to his mental state and his panic attack. So yeah. let's listen to a small portion of that from this morning. And then I'll, have, I'll bring Ken in to, to discuss how we think this affected the case. Alright, so uh, I was thinking about, you know, that's true. When I, uh, you know, I started thinking, thinking about it, I was, you know, it was just incredibly crazy what I was, like, my, my view. And, like, you know, it was fucking crazy that 
I want to construct a mission that's going to murder a girl. And, and die. It's not exactly the healthiest stuff. Alright. So I was thinking about it, you know, I you know, I came to my decision that I was going to do it. You know, start playing it now. But you know, I started thinking about it. I realized, you know, like, hey, you know what? I'm here to start my career. I have a suicide thought, I have a murderous thought. I, I, you know what? We'll make this get some And welcome back, everybody, to the Law News Network. I'm your host this morning, Rachel Stockman, and for the next several hours, uh, we were just listening to uh, a recording that was played in court this morning in the Adrian Loya case. He's the former uh, Coast Guard member who's accused of murdering uh, a woman, a fellow member of the Coast Guard, who he claims sexually assaulted her, him, and that that was the motivation for the killing. The defense says uh, he is not criminally responsible for what happened. I'm joined by Ken Belkin. We were just listening to some of the tape uh, from 2014 that Mr. Loya recorded of himself after he'd set up a camera to spy uh, on these victims here. Crazy case. The details of this yeah, case, Ken, insane. are just absurd, insane. You could see why, if you were a jury, you'd say this guy is nuts. The yeah. question... Is he is legally he, is nuts? Is he legally nuts? And that's going to be a tough one. Legally nuts. Uh, that's going to be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> uh, you know, look, uh, all these, th this, this 15 minutes of him talking to himself, having the panic attack, th that that's really gives you pause here. It does give you pause. And then putting Dr. Martin Kelly on the stand right after. I mean, as we said during the break, this is about as good of a day for the defense as they can hope to have in this case. And I'm surprised, quite frankly, at, at them having this good of a day. But, uh, you know, we'll have to see as it goes on. Because when we were talking earlier, you know, I think that you did agree that this is going to be a very hard case th for the defense to win. Yeah. Because the crime's so brutal, it was planned out so meticulously. Uh, and if you listen to uh, Adrian talk about it, it really does appear he understands and is fully aware of what he's doing. Yeah, the, the evidence is overwhelming in this case. I mean, you've got GoPro camera footage. You, you've got this manuscript. You've got the statements to the police during his interrogation. Uh, you've got the eyewitness testimony of, of the spouse of the victim. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming. You know, reasonable doubt here is all but evaporated. Now the question is, the burden now shifts because the defense is mounting an affirmative defense of not guilty by reason of insanity. This guy had a mental health defect, could not appreciate the difference between right and wrong. You know, and now even one of the prosecution's very own witnesses has reached the conclusion that he could not appreciate the difference between right and wrong. And Aaron Keller, one of our uh, afternoon guests, pointed out to me just now um, that the state has the burden of proving that he's not suffering from a mental defect in Massachusetts. That's particularly interesting considering that testimony from Dr. Martin Kelly. Yeah. Uh, because if that's their burden, they didn't do a very good job this morning of meeting that burden. No, but I think that in the, in the final analysis, even though this guy has reached a different conclusion, you know, they're gonna say that this guy is some sort of pie in the sky academic and use your common sense. You don't need a Harvard doctor right. to tell you that if a guy sets up incendiary devices, 
sets his car on fire as a blockade to impede law enforcement's ability to respond to something he, and, and the way he dressed in, in the gear, ready for a war zone, that this guy knew law enforcement was going to respond. He knew that law enforcement was going to respond with force. He intended for them to respond in force because he said in an interrogation that he intended to die at the end of this. That He, he intended, thought police were going to shoot yeah, him. He, he was actually impressed by their, their restraint. Right. Maybe the first time I've heard that one. But, you know, look, at the end of the day, he knew that law enforcement was coming. Why does law enforcement come? Why does someone prepare for law enforcement to come? Because they have an inkling of an idea that what they're doing is wrong and merits law enforcement's attention. And, I think and the fact, Ken, that he uh, set this car ablaze to distract police from, from yeah. the scene, that shows you he knows that what he's doing is wrong because if he didn't want police to find him or find the scene, that's pretty damning evidence yeah. as well. And it's, you know, look, people may not agree with this statement. Uh, I don't know that I totally agree with it. But it's a common belief that law enforcement doesn't kill you unless you're doing something really egregious and they have to. And I think that was his intention, to be murdered, suicide by police. And, you know, you, you only get to suicide by police by doing something that would warrant the police employing lethal force. Uh, so the question then is going to be, how are the jurors going to interpret the testimony we're hearing right now by this uh, medical professional, especially given the fact he's um, a prosecution witness? And I can guarantee to you, uh, unless, unless they don't think they even need to, but I would assume that when the defense puts their case on, they're going to also bring at least one or two of their own expert yeah, witnesses absolutely. to testify. I mean, they kind of have to, to um, uh, to Adrian's mental state. Yeah, it, it would be interesting if they didn't, because then they could say in closing, we didn't even need an expert. Right. Prosecution's expert. They did, did it, it for us. They did it for us. But look, it, it's very important that, look, you might have a reasonable doubt now because of his mental illness, but that's not the standard. They don't have to get to reasonable doubt here. They have to prove that this guy, be due to a mental disease or defect, could not appreciate right and wrong. The defense has to prove that. And, and it's very tough when the burden shifts onto the defense. And these defenses typically do not work. Statistically, it's, it's been pretty borne out that the uh, defense of insanity is largely ineffective. That, it, that jurors rarely buy into They it. rarely buy it. So I, I don't know if you caught it yesterday, Ken. Uh, Anna Trubnikova, who was the victim, who was murder's wife, she was also a victim in this. Uh, she was injured as well. She took the stand. Um, and her testimony was very compelling. Uh, it was heart-wrenching, it was hard to listen to because she talked about those last moments um, when her wife, her loved ones dying, give, you know, giving her the last kiss. I mean, it's just very hard to listen to. I wanna play a little bit